2008, President Obama and Senator McCain disagreed about virtually everything, as did President Bush and Senator Kerry, with the exception of one thing, and that is that the number one threat to the country in their judgment on a bipartisan basis was the threat of terrorists acquiring nuclear weapons. And many experts agree that at least one way uh, in which terrorists might attempt to smuggle a nuclear weapon into our country or nuclear material might be aboard one of the 11 to 12 million cargo containers that comes into our 360-some seaports every year. To talk about this threat uh, in great detail, uh, we have a superb moderator, Robert O'Hara at the Washington Post, is well known to all of us who follow Homeland Security issues. He's an expert in the whole wide range of issues in the Homeland Security space, intelligence, um, as I say, the range of issues. But I associate him in particular with his really seminal work, I think, on maritime security. When I was thinking of the ideal moderator for this panel this year, uh, I thought only of Robert. So I'm delighted that you're here to, to, uh, to moderate this session. And to talk about this issue, we have two superb people, Donald Cusser, who, as you see, is the Assistant Port Director for Tactical Operations at uh, Los Angeles Long Beach Seaport and Customs and Border Protection from the Department of Homeland Security. Needless to say, Los Angeles is one of the major uh, seaports in the United States. And then Stephen Caldwell at uh, the Government Accountability Office, who likewise has done superb, really extraordinary work, uh, generally speaking, with regard to homeland security, and in particular with regard to maritime security. So with that, Robert O'Hara. As you all know that uh, after 9-11, uh, one of the issues that came to dominate political discussions and policy debates behind closed doors was the, uh, the nuclear threat. Uh, the specter of the mushroom cloud uh, came to hover over everybody uh, like a pall. It was a very scary prospect. And that specter became a sort of reality uh, shaping a lot of not only policy but the creation of special offices and efforts to uh, prevent the importation of nuclear materials, radioactive materials into the U.S. Uh, as some of you in this room and others were contemplating how that would be done, they quickly focused on one avenue uh, which were uh, cargo containers. Uh, you may know that about 10 million cargo containers enters the country from 611 foreign ports. Uh, if you do the math, that's 27,000 cargo containers coming to the U.S. every day. Uh, the nation gave itself a tall task. It was going to scan every one of them for radioactive materials. Now, to me, that almost seems not laughable, but it seems almost like a theoretical logistical exercise. And yet, of course, it's real. It's as real as can be. All, all it takes is for one of those containers with radioactive materials coming in and getting into the hands of the wrong people, and you have uh, what Leiter might have described earlier as an existential threat uh, to the United States. Very different thing even than from 9-11. To address this challenge, uh, DHS created the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, and they began uh, very quickly working on cutting-edge technology to, uh, to scan these many cargo containers. Uh, sadly, uh, two of the major programs have uh, fallen short and uh, have been canceled. One of them, called CARS, was going to automatically detect and identify anomalies in, uh, in the containers that would uh, suggest highly shielded nuclear materials. Another one was called ASP, uh, and it was a, a very sophisticated system that would not only detect the materials but identify its signature and, and, and allow uh, port authorities to uh, uh, more quickly identify whether there's benign materials like cat litter or ch you know, China that has a radioactive signature from the very bad stuff that could uh, do us harm. Uh, those systems failed. Uh, the ASP system uh, the program was canceled this week after a, a very long, rocky effort uh, that included allegations that uh, DN DNDO wasn't um, uh, fully informing Congress about the costs and the benefits. And so right now, uh, six years later, uh, we have to ask the question, where does that leave us? Uh, what, what are we doing to to protect against this existential threat. Uh, I think we all agree that it's remote because of the technical difficulties and because of the uh, many efforts that uh, 
the country has made abroad and, and at home. But it's a, it's a very real threat, and I think we'd be foolish to ignore it. So the question is, what are we going to do going forward? Are, are we going to keep aiming for technology silver bullets? Or are we going to go for the more pedestrian but fundamentally important steps to, uh, to do what we call layered security? Um, and what level of risks are we willing to tolerate in order to keep commerce flowing um, freely as Congress has demanded? Uh, it's a very tall task. And here to talk about it today are, uh, are these two fellows who've devoted their lives in recent years to uh, answering some of the questions. So why don't you get started? And what we're going to try to do is leave a little more time than some of the other panels for a question and answer, because I think, uh, I think we can mix it up a little better that way. Steve, why don't you uh, tell us a few things? Uh, thank you very much. First, I want to thank the Aspen Institute for putting together this, uh, this very important conference as well as to uh, Clark Kent for the, for the introduction that he did. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about my introduction and work I've done for Congress in analyzing maritime security issues. After the Oklahoma City bombings in 1996, Congress became very interested in oversight uh, and engaged GAO to do reports on interagency federal programs to combat terrorism. And it was really the, the 2000 uh, USSS coal bomb uh, in Yemen that led to a, a real specific focus on congressional oversight through GAO of the uh, maritime domain. So, um, you know, the 9-11 uh, attacks were obviously a watershed event, and in many ways they can actually be thought of as a, as a maritime event as well. New York is one of our key port cities for a wide variety of commodities. Uh, you also have uh, the Twin Towers were actually owned and operated by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And then finally, the port itself was critical to the response and the evacuation of New York right after the attacks. So, so here we are, we're 10 years after 9-11, we're nine years after the Maritime Transportation Security Act, and five years after the S Safe Port Act. So it's a, it's a very good time for conferences like this that ask where are we now and, and where are we going. So I'm gonna go through what are kind of my top five issues in maritime security at a fairly high level, and then I'm happy to go into more detail, either uh, collectively with the panel or, or um, with you folks as the audience as we move on. Um, I think the, the first key issue, and following up on Bob's comments, is trying to redefine what normal is in terms of uh, the global maritime supply chain security. All those millions of containers that come not only to the United States, but go all over the world in terms of moving cargoes. And uh, as, as Bob had indicated, uh, and he just touched on a few of them, but there were many other programs put in place to try to improve cargo security uh, right after 9-11. And for the most part, our trade partners, both at the foreign government level as well as at the business level, uh, embraced and um, participated uh, very vigorously in those programs. Uh, and these are programs that, that some of you may be aware of, uh, such as CSI, CTPAT, and uh, the 24-hour rule, which evolved into uh, the 10 plus 2 program. You know, but these, uh, again, following along the lines of what Bob had said, these, these programs led to some uh, overly optimistic views in terms of what technology could do for us. Uh, and I think from both the executive branch, uh, from industry, as well as from Congress, uh, there was really a, a, maybe a... a inappropriate level of optimism about how fast these programs could move to try to almost guarantee security from either nuclear threats or other things that could be put into containers. Uh, and this led to the statutory requirement that all containers be scanned before they're loaded actually on the ships bound for the United States. Um, since Bob has already discussed some of these, I won't go into all the gory details of uh, the development of the 100% scanning and, and some of the uh, uh, lack of progress in some of the pilot ports where it was actually tried. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is that the, uh, the technologies that were being developed certainly did not deliver on what their original promises were. And uh, at some point, the international and the business community pretty much revolted uh, against this as what they saw as a uh, U.S.-centric and unilateral mandate to the rest of the world. So the question is, where are we now? And uh, I think there's a growing realization that the 100% scan requirement is not feasible, either from a technical, uh, logistical, or, or even economic standpoint. 
Um, but there needs to be some kind of agreement or compromise reached between Congress uh, and the White House and, and DHS. CBP is obviously an important part of that on where we go from now in terms of what will be uh, an acceptable level or what I call a, a new normal level of uh, security for containers. And of course, you know, the repercussions of this are global and the whole uh, international and business community are waiting to see what the outcome of this uh, debate and discussion is. Then moving on to a couple of other areas that, that Bob didn't mention and uh, maybe are a little different than the areas that uh, uh, Don deals with at CBP. But one of those areas is the small vessel threat. This is the threat of terrorists using a small vessel packed with explosives to either attack a larger vessel or some kind of uh, waterside port infrastructure. And a particular concern, of course, would be a small vessel threat against a passenger vessel, such as, say, a ferry or a cruise ship. DHS does have a strategy to deal with that, and uh, I think there's some very positive aspects about that strategy as well as its implementation plan. Uh, but the bottom line is these millions of boats are out there and they're moving around and, and that threat is going to be with us a long time, if, if not forever. Uh, my third issue of concern is piracy, specifically the prospect of Somali-style piracy expanding far beyond the uh, Gulf of Aden. And for those of you that know a little bit about this area, that's already started to happen. You know, from a Western perspective, uh, the pirates are what we would call, or particular academics would call, a uh, intelligent or a adaptive adversary. They're very good at looking at what we do and doing something different and part of that was uh, when we had naval escorts in the Gulf of Aden to moving far out into the Indian Ocean. And from the pirates perspective they have a very successful business model. They make a lot of money. The ransoms have been as high as 12 million dollars for some of the vessels that they seized. So success will breed imitation and if it hasn't already happened this is going to get the attention of transnational organized crime organizations. And uh, the concern is that their business model will be relatively easy to replicate in other parts of the world where maritime governance is weak. Uh, my fourth issue is maritime energy supply, both overseas and domestically. Uh, the maritime domain is critical to energy in terms that over 50% of our petroleum products come in by sea, by tankers. And in addition, uh, more than a third of our energy production domestically is coming from domestic wells off our shores, uh, somewhere off the outer continental shelf, and 60% uh, of our domestic uh, reserves are again uh, offshore. And I think what's uh, really of concern to us, and we've shown this in some of our previous work at JO, is uh, that the response to such an attack in our uh, domestic maritime space is particularly complex. If you look at the Deepwater Horizon and the response to that last year, try to take that response and on top of that you want to put a security and a law enforcement response. And you can see the challenge, which was a huge challenge and basically absorbed the entire nation for much of last year, uh, would be an even bigger challenge. And then the final issue I want to talk about, which, which really relates to all the issues we've talked about so far, uh, is uh, sustainability. And this is maybe a good place for me to end my discussion. But you know, in the absence of any credible domestic threats or attacks to the maritime domain, to our domestic ports, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to maintain what we have in terms of declining budgets. You know, despite many of the predictions and, and concerns, and it's not that it couldn't happen or this couldn't happen very quickly, uh, there just have not been um, credible threats or attacks. And even before this year's uh, almost historic budget battles between the White House and Congress, uh, there's already been a pretty clear decline over the last two years in both Coast Guard and CBP funding for their security areas. Uh, and then in conclusion, I think, you know, the issue we face in maritime security is an old one. It's uh, how much is enough? It's uh, do we already have too much or is what we have actually needed? And then finally, I, I think that this last question, the way I would put it, is can we even sustain what we have? We have a lot of programs out there, but it's going to cost a lot of money to keep them going. You know, one example to maybe a, a lot of people out there is, is the port security grants. We've given a lot of money from the federal government to ports to put a lot of security measures in place, uh, either at private terminals or, or with uh, state and local port authorities. But in many cases, they're going to need money to keep those going up, and that's another area where the budget's starting to decline. So. I think uh, clearly uh, it's fascinating stuff. I find it a lot scarier 
uh, after a few minutes of thought about the potential threat than it might seem when you're dealing with the bureaucratic uh, budget issues and so on, because how do you assess the risk of 27,000 cargo containers coming in? And how do you convey that to the budget masters in Congress without seeming shrill? And then how do you, as you pointed out, sustain that, which seems to be uh, really an overarching issue, overarching issue with almost everything that we're discussing these days here, uh, which is how do you sustain uh, support and focus on these kinds of threats when you haven't had an attack? And I think that that's, um, that's more than just a technical answer. It's a political, policy, social, maybe even emotional uh, components to uh, staying focused on something that, as I said, if you think about it for just a few minutes, 611 foreign ports are sending stuff in, and there's a lot of noise, which is all these cargo containers, and if you hide one signal in there that could you know, really do massive damage, um, it's a scary thought. Donald, why don't you give us uh, uh, some of your thoughts about uh, sure. your perspective. Okay. Tell us, tell us, give us some precision about what you do uh, because you operate uh, in a corner of this world, but you have really the bulk of the cargo containers coming right through your port. Absolutely. The uh, LA Long Beach Seaport is by far the largest seaport in the United States. Get a little over 5 million uh, container arrivals a year. The next largest seaport in the United States is uh, 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 Newark, New Jersey. They get about, uh, roughly about uh, one uh, uh, million containers a year. So we're about five times the size of uh, Newark. And actually, if you roll up the, uh, the volume at the next eight largest seaports in the United States, which are Newark, Savannah, Charleston, Norfolk, Seattle, Tacoma, Houston, and Miami, that equals the volume that we get in LA Long Beach. So it's a, it's a huge operation. So how do we deal with that volume of cargo coming our way? Well, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has a very sophisticated layered enforcement strategy that we have uh, uh, in place, and it all begins 24 hours prior to loading a container on board a vessel overseas. So we get advanced information of everything that's inside those containers 24 hours before that container is even loaded on board a vessel overseas. And that really ties into our, our uh, uh, container security initiative where we have officers, CBP officers, stationed in 58 different foreign seaports throughout the world. And the, and the uh, uh, idea behind that is if there's, a, if there's a shipment of concern that we don't want loaded on board that vessel, we have officers stationed overseas that can work with the foreign host government to do an examination on that high-risk cargo prior to it being loaded on board that vessel and coming to our shores. Because obviously you don't want to wait until, you know, you know, until something arrives here at our, 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 uh, our doorstep you know, to do the examination. So, so there's that, that uh, uh, part of the process. And then, um, you know, we also have our, our uh, domestic targeting units as well. All that advanced information that we receive about the manifest is fed into our automated targeting system, which is a very uh, sophisticated rules-based system. I won't get into a lot of details on how it works or whatever, but um, so, and, and that basically is a, a risk assessment tool that our officers use, not only here domestically at each individual seaport, we have our, our own targeting units, but also at the National Targeting Center near uh, uh, Washington, D.C., but also the officers that I mentioned are state, that are stationed overseas also have access to the system. And we're constantly going in and looking at these shipments, determining what the risk is, and if anything uh, uh, presents an unacceptable risk, we do not allow that shipment to come to the United States. We can hopefully uh, examine it overseas. And then also, um, for the lower risk shipments that we do allow to uh, uh, proceed to the United States, uh, our targeting efforts continue as that vessel's on its way here. And we flag those, those shipments that we deem to be of highest risk, and we send a message back to the ocean carrier letting them know that they cannot release that container upon arrival in the United States. And that's where the next layer of our, our strategy comes into place where we have very sophisticated uh, non-intrusive inspection technology, which are these large uh, uh, gamma ray and x-ray trucks that we use to actually uh, x-ray the, uh, the uh, highest risk containers, if you will. And then, uh, you know, of course, last but not least, um, and many people don't know this, and they're often surprised when I tell them this, but since, since November of 2006, we have screened 100% of all arriving containers through LA Long Beach for the presence of radiation. So on a daily basis, um, we screen anywhere between 22,000 to 26,000 containers a day pass through our radiation portal monitors at the LA Long Beach seaport 
and that usually results in anywhere between 300 to 600 alarms per day that our officers actually have to adjudicate. So um, our, our current radiation uh, portal monitor technology tells us if there's a presence of radiation inside that container, the officers will then pull, pull those uh, uh, containers aside. They'll go through a secondary portal to verify the, uh, the first alarm. And then what they'll do is they'll take a radiation isotope identifier, take readings from the container, and uh, match that isotope versus what's inside the, the uh, shipment. As many of you probably know, there's a lot of commodities coming into the United States that are supposed to be giving off what we call naturally occurring radioactive material, or NORM, things like television sets, uh, porcelain products, ceramic tile, everybody wants uh, 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 granite uh, uh, countertops in their kitchen, you know, things like that. So those will alert out our radiation portal monitors. The officers will take a reading from those containers, compare that versus what's on the manifest, and, um, and then if everything checks out okay, they'll go ahead and release those uh, uh, shipments. But again, 26, 22,000, 26,000 containers a day are being screened for the, for the presence of radiation. This is just in LA Long Beach. Um, and uh, that usually results anywhere between 300 to 600 alarms per day that our officers have to uh, uh, actually adjudicate. So the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, I mean, vessels don't just arrive here in the United States unannounced. I mean, you know, large cargo ships don't just show up in LA Long Beach and say, here we are. I mean, we know they're coming well in advance. We get the information, again, 24 hours prior to those containers even being loaded on board that vessel, whether it's over in China, Japan, wherever it's coming from. And, you know, and the, and the actual screening process takes place overseas where we have officers stationed in 58 different foreign seaports. And then the last aspect of the uh, uh, cargo security strategy is what's known as the uh, CTPAT program. It's the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, and that really recognizes that, you know, that, that we can't do it alone. I mean, the, the owners of the uh, uh, supply chain, you know, the manufacturers, the shippers, the carriers, the importers, the exporters, <coughs> the brokers, um, all, all have to have a role in this as well. So, and, and we actually certify them through the CTPAT program that they you know, upgrade their uh, uh, security procedures. We have supply chain specialists that are deployed overseas and they'll go to you know, foreign factories overseas to make sure that their factories are secure, they have the proper fencing, all that, all that sort of stuff um, uh, uh, in place. And then in turn, they get certain benefits for uh, expedited processing with, with their shipments upon arrival. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, that strikes me as really, really laborious, grinding work to protect against this potential small but catastrophic threat. Uh, uh, do we have the, do you think we have the will right now, do you sense, to keep doing this for, let's say, the next 30 years? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're obviously going to do it as long as it takes. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges for us, I mean, and I have, you know, I have 150 officers a day, uh, which, is, which is a large chunk of my uh, workforce, that are there just to adjudicate three to 600 alarms per day. So as you can imagine, that gets a little bit tedious for the officers to go out there. I imagine if you're, if, you know, if, if you're working in your office every day and the uh, 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 fire alarm goes off 10 times. So how, you know, how, how are you going to respond when it, when it goes off on the 10th uh, time? So We heard that uh, oh, starting five or six years ago, uh, that technology was going to be the answer. And uh, clearly, I, it seems to me, you can't solve this problem without the mix of the intelligence, the algorithms, the black box stuff, lots of good work and hard work by people. Um, but the, the technology, but we have seen these programs that were going like gangbusters falter. They have not panned out as we hope. Uh, what, do, what do we think about that? How, uh, how much are we going to rely on the technology now in the coming years? Are you referring to like ASP and things yep. like that? Okay. Um, well, I mean, Can I you think. Give a, give a little background on, on CBP's experience with the technology and what happened. Well, I, I think that the, uh, the current technology we have in place works. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of officers to operate it. That's because so I of think, the false alarms. Um, they're not false alarms. They're 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 legitimate alarms. Excuse but you know the officers have to adjudicate those. So what we want in the future is to have technology that's smart enough to know that okay, you have a shipment of ceramic tile here, for example, and the the radiation detection technology is smart enough to know that it's not a, it's not a threat. So it won't it won't alarm you know the, the officers. So I think that's, that's really where we want to get to. So whatever, whatever way we get there, whatever system gets uh, uh, 
uh, uh, developed and put in place would be great. Steve, tell us what happened to these programs. Where they were announced with great fanfare, um, and I think there was obviously a lot of hard work that was done on them, but they uh, really hit the rocks in a lot of ways, and I think that that's the nature of developing new technology, uh, whether you're building software for word processing or you know, neural networks or for uh, this kind of screening. Well, you know, Joe, we like to be balanced, so I want to talk about some of the positive things that have happened, and, and maybe I'll make a distinction between, say, some of the software successes and some of the, uh, the hardware uh, less than successes. And for example, uh, the ATS system uh, is basically a software program where they take, you know, just mil it's, it's hundreds of data elements on these millions of containers and analyzes them to try to identify are there any kind of unusual anomalies from that perspective. Those are actually gone pretty well. And even in the 100% scanning um, pilot ports, they were able to take uh, the data that they had from their ATS system, which is kind of an advanced system about the risks. They were able to combine that with uh, what they're getting from their scans that are like x-rays, as well as what they were getting from their scans to determine radiation. So there were some successes there, and it's actually pretty impressive to see those, to have seen those operations and seen what they have done. I think that the, the problems with some of the technology happened when um, you tried to skip to the next generation too fast. Tell us a, a, just briefly about uh, a couple of examples so we can ground Yeah, so, so two examples, which you've already mentioned, with the CARS program and the ASP program. And, uh, you know, I think part of it obviously was a, a, a big political concern and push to move these programs out as quickly as we could. But uh, at one point they talked about the, the CARS program, which was a uh, x-ray program that would give higher fidelity than the existing x-ray programs and would be able to process trucks, because basically trucks are driving through these things um, in a much higher volume than had ever been imagined. For example, at one time they were hoping to do 120 trucks an hour. Now, if any of you have actually been to a port and seen this, that's, that's impossible because you just can't get the trucks to queue up and actually operate that quickly. But a higher volume would, would help. Uh, uh, so that's, that's the CARS program. Uh, what uh, The other program was the ASP, the um, I'm always forgetting what the acronym is, so I apologize Advanced for that. Advanced Spectroscopic Portal. Exactly, the, the ASP. <laughs> and and um, this was a way to go beyond current uh, radiation portal monitors to identify not just this, that there was radiation, but to identify the very specific isotope and to do it quickly and, again, to do it very accurately. And this helps very much if you're trying to determine, you know, what does the manifest say is in this thing? What is the radiological signature, and does that make sense? And if it does, you let it go through. If it requires maybe some further investigation, you do that. And I think what the, the push was from both uh, political, both uh, from, from Congress and within the department, was to get these programs moving out very fast so they really were not tested in an operational environment before decisions were made to go ahead and start acquiring them. So usually in the acquisition process, you have R&D, uh, and then the R&D gets to a certain point. You go into operational testing. You do that, say, at a pilot point. For both those programs, decisions were made to move into the acquisition phase before they were actually proven in that operational environment. And so me, some shortcuts were taken. I'll jump in here. One of the things that we've seen, and I'm sure some of you have uh, struggled with this, is the rush to implement new technology to, technology to solve problems very quickly. It could be... Uh, certain types of uh, passenger profiling systems. It could be uh, the borders, U.S. visit. Uh, but there's been uh, case after case where new, tech new programs, new technology uh, uh, were embraced very quickly. And it's only later that we found out it didn't work and we've lost the time and the money. Um, I'm curious, uh, whether it's from someone here in the audience or from you two, about uh, uh, how much responsibility Congress needs to take uh, for demanding the impossible now, and secondarily, how much uh, the agency leaders, uh, how much responsibility they bear uh, f for not doing the difficult thing of saying, are you out of your mind? Um, would anybody like to try that, or does anybody care to address that uh, here in the audience? Um, what I, I think we'll do here is, uh, uh, if you don't want to talk about Congress's no, culpability no, no. here, Oh, please do. Why don't you start off? Here's what we're going to do is 
go ahead and open up the floor to questions. Um, and I think we'll just use our time that way. Uh, please, um, after I call on you, uh, wait for the microphone. They want to record this uh, for our posterity. Uh, Michael Kelly with a company called Task. Um, putting the blame on Congress is fair. Putting the blame on administrative administration officials is fair. Putting the blame on uh, the industry supporters is fair. Uh, but what do you do uh, in the circumstances that we were in where you have an agency that has been told to plan, organize, and execute on day one? No opportunity to, to be in a cadre status or to build up the process. And you have to deal with everybody's interest as well as the challenge of a catastrophic event, which, which we all thought and still think is pretty real. Uh, the other part of the problem, which I would suggest is, is really underlying all of this, is a fundamental acquisition process that really doesn't yet exist in DHS. You have operational entities that are working their own systems. Uh, you have new entities like DNDO that stood up and they had to create a process out of nothing. So right, wrong, or indifferent, everybody trying to do the right thing is reacting to the environment around them. So my, my point is, and get back to the comment about the Hill, is until there is, is a new authorization bill of some sort that looks at the organization and looks at the acquisition process, we're going to continue to see these kinds of problems. I, I think that's very uh, uh, incisive. Um, I think it's really interesting how utterly boring a lot of this stuff seems on the surface. At, you used the phrase acquisition process, did you? I mean, that's eye-glazing stuff, and yet, this boring stuff goes to the heart of our national security. Uh, uh, will you address the question about the process of developing the new technology? I, I feel like in some cases it almost sounds like you're saying that people were buffeted by the winds you know, of change when in fact there were clear choices that were made uh, not to test things a certain way. Why don't you tell us about, uh, focus on the ASP because I think it's a good example of earnest desire that led to sidestepping a lot of standard procedures for research and development? Well, in my work, I've talked to a lot of people in the scientific community. I'm not a scientist. But when you talk to the chief scientists at SAIC or some of these other uh, ASC or the other companies that are doing this, and you see how creative they're trying to be in terms of trying to use science in a different way. You know, you have a lot of respect for that. The technology, unfortunately, doesn't always, uh, you know, cooperate with them. And so uh, sometimes they're, they're pretty good at trying to sell where they want to go, but uh, they acknowledge, they don't know if it'll get there or not, but somewhere along the political process, either in a department and going all the way up to Congress, it's like, boy, there's this new technology, if we only you know, had enough money to push it really fast, it, it could work. But uh, in, in terms of uh, the testing, for example, some of GAO's work on the ASP found that the different companies that were running their products through the testing, or actually they had the portal monitors and the uh, radioactive sources were being run through there, uh, they had pretty detailed knowledge on what those sources were in advance, as opposed to trying to do more operational testing where you have to kind of set your, uh, you have to calibrate your machines to try to get a wide variety of potential radioactive sources that might go through there. And some machines might be better at detecting some than others. So in our view, those tests were not uh, accurate or realistic because they didn't have that kind of uh, unknown component that you have in operational testing. So it moved the program along quickly in the short run, but in the long run, we weren't sure if the machines worked as well as. Correct. And as I said, uh, both the, the, the CARS program and the ASP program were pushed into the acquisition deployment phase, or at least the path toward that, uh, before some of these tests were complete. Uh, for the CARS program, to DNDO's credit, and, and uh, once they started working more closely with CBP on it, what are these things actually going to do and how are we going to actually use them? Uh, they did ramp that program back down to a pure R&D program, which is where it belonged in the first place. Yes. Yes, uh, I'm Bill Estrin, Washington, D.C. 
I may be going back in time, and I'm interested, maybe you all remember, but I was involved with a company that had access to and presented to the largest container company in the world at that time a satellite tracking system that existed fully functional with sensors to be put into the containers that would both tell if they'd been opened, tampered with from once they were sealed, anywhere that they traveled, and could also sense the air and, and, the, and the radioactivity within the container. The only reason the company wouldn't do it at that time was only if the United States made it mandatory because the containers cost $1,500 a container and the sensor and, uh, tracking device would have been $150. And the cost to them would have been three quarters of a billion. They would have done it, but not unless the United States made it mandatory. Hmm. Do you know about that? And what is your reaction if such a thing does exist and does function and whether the cost would diminish your time and effort in, in, in what you're doing? Donald, what do you think? I think you know, if we could get there, then that, then that would be great. But I, I know that they, they did test pilot a few of those uh, systems, and, they, and there were some issues with it. And you know, one of the major issues for us is uh, 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 false alarms. So you know, if I have 5 million containers a year coming into LA Long Beach, and let's say the false alarm rate for those systems was, say, 5%, then my officers are you know, running around the seaport chasing <laughs> down what, what's 5% what's, uh, of you know, five, 5 million. So they're, they're spending all their time chasing down false alarms. So you know, I, think, I think if we can eventually get there with, with that kind of technology, it would be great. But again, but the, the actual uh, uh, false alarm rate has to be very, very low. Good. Um, I know maybe going back a little bit, are we talking about the General Electric technology? OK. OK. So um, I know there was, was some earlier work by GA, uh, I'm not GA, but uh, GE as well as Orbcom and others to try to get at those things. And the bottom line, at least for GE, GE was, you know, in terms of business model, if you don't have the volume, you know, if it's not going to be used in volume, or you're not, it, it's just not going to be justified. And I think it was kind of disappointing to those that were tracking it at that time uh, that GA, GE pulled out. But it was, you know, in the end, it is a business decision on those things. Um, for some of the other issues in terms of tracking, um, we just did work recently last year on container security devices which detect intrusion, say six-side intrusion and things like that. And at least the tests we looked at where uh, S&T and CBP actually did operational testing, um, none of them met the criteria in terms of the reliability, the alarm rate, uh, the sustainability in terms of battery life and those kinds of things you needed. Mm. But uh, keep trying and they are going to keep trying. and. I think we have someone we should probably hear from. Yes, back here. here. Yes. Hi, Dan. Um, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is Colonel Brown. I'm actually an Army officer, but I, I teach at the uh, Naval War College in Newport. <clears throat> I noticed that, uh, you know, most of our focus on this discussion is on uh, the nuclear threat. Um, but I also noticed that Michael Leiter uh, said earlier this morning that smaller attacks, smaller events, you know, could produce strategic effects. So I'd like to ask a slightly different question. Um, and also Stephen mentioned earlier about uh, a concern over small vessel threat. How vulnerable are we to some form of maritime security threat from an explosion that would result in maybe an oil spill in the Chesapeake or even a, a, a liquid uh, natural gas container or this sort of thing that would produce, you know, a significant uh, destructive effect into one of our major ports or uh, a significant environmental damage that would uh, have a huge strategic effect to the U.S. Don? Well, I'll, I'll just tell you that, you know, we're always working with our, our four partners as well through the uh, area, area Maritime Security Committee, and those are things that we meet on a, a, a quarterly basis to discuss. That's really a... a, 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 a question for the U.S. Coast Guard, but, um, but I can just tell you that, you know, working with our port partners, you know, looking at overall port security to address issues just like the one you just mentioned are things that we talk about on a, a, a routine basis in those, in those meetings. In the back. Tom 
Goldberg. I run a company in Washington representing a number of technology uh, uh, developers, and their big issue, picking up on the first questioner or commenter's uh, point, was that the acquisition development process at CPB or at Coast Guard seems entirely dysfunctional. We're focused on large enterprises producing technologies at a fairly robust cost. And so given the fact that ASP is in some uh, senses in review, are there portals of entry for new technologies uh, from smaller enterprises or uh, academic institutions that have won the attention of other government agencies, DITRA, for instance, DARPA, for instance, and can they be funneled across, if you will, the bureaucratic divide into CPB, into Coast Guard? Why don't you uh, take a crack at that one? Yeah, I'm not sure um, either Don or I are, are, have a lot of expertise in terms of, uh, as much expertise in terms of the acquisition process and the entree. I mean, some of the work we've done on container security technologies, um, some of those were small to medium firms, so I think there is hope out there for those that do it. Uh, you know, I get calls all the time after a talk like this or at, at uh, a conference about asking for the contact at DHS so that, you know, they, the, the person with this, uh, you know, great contract get there, which I, of course, I have to decline providing that kind of information. But uh, uh, I'll take a crack. I've written a lot about acquisition for the Washington Post, and I've heard a lot from s small and medium businesses that are really frustrated. They have the next great mousetrap, uh, and I don't doubt that they do, and they can't crack through the acquisition system, uh, which oftentimes is dominated by the, the, the big guys in Washington. And I'll say, once again, it seems boring, but the acquisition is so fundamental to the operation of our government, not just with national security. And uh, sadly, um, in many ways, it really is dysfunctional. Uh, if you look uh, at the workforce in the DOD, for example, it was cut in half in the 90s in the Clinton administration as a kind of a windfall from the Cold War ending. Uh, from 2000 to the present, the net increase in the DOD's workforce for contracting for acquisition has been uh, almost nil. Um, I, I heard from somebody the net gain is 25 people in that time when the spending has gone up by, you know, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, $150 billion, $200 billion in, in the government. In other words, there's so much spending going on, we rely so heavily, uh, our government works with contractors. I mean, it works because of contractors in many ways. And yet, we don't have the workforce to watch this, to manage it, uh, to make sure the money's well spent, and to make sure the uh, projects with merit get into the system. So it's a fundamentally important pro a problem for maritime contracting, for national security contracting, and contracting in general. Other questions here? Any comments? Um, I just want to make another comment in terms of the, the question about some of the other threats uh, in terms of LNG and things like that. We had done some work a couple years back on LNG and oil tankers, and um, actually the bigger concern that came out of that, that you know, to the Coast Guard's credit, they're pursuing is what they call certain dangerous cargoes, and the um, focus on which, which really are the most dangerous things moving through our ports, and um, they're actually not LNG or oil or energy products, there are uh, certain chemicals that I won't go into in, in detail. But there's a working group that they have uh, at Coast Guard to try to determine which of those they need to maybe put additional um, requirements on or at least apply additional Coast Guard assets to such as uh, boat escorts, armed boat escorts for when those boats, boats do come into ports and actually maybe for the terminals that use those kinds of uh, vessels to uh, ramp up their security appropriately. Any other th thoughts or questions here? Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm Warren Stern, the current director of the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office. And um, uh, Bob is one of our um, harshest critics, but as one of our harshest critics, I'm um, uh, very pleased at how much I agree with um, almost everything you've said. Uh, t t technology alone can never solve problems. 
And so we're focused on a new strategy that integrates technology with users and our intelligence community in terms of um, how we move forward in the future. A, a lot of the discussion has been on the acquisitions process and how it's gone wrong in the past. So I want to make sure it's understood that, that now within DHS we have a new acquisitions development process and within DNDO we have a, a, a different solutions development process that's even more rigorous to ensure that mistakes that have happened in the past won't happen in, in the future. Um, so, so there is now an acquisitions process that didn't exist several years ago that the ASP system and, and a few others didn't follow because it didn't exist, but it's changed. Um, on the question about small businesses, um, at the NDO we actually have a, a specific process for small businesses. We have specifically have um, within our um, R&D um, office a specific process for um, academic re research so that we can bring in new technologies and move them along the pathway to something that can actually be used by the users. So whoever asked that question, if you wanted to send me an email, I'd be happy to, to follow up on it, but we, we have a process for that. I, I, it, but let's, let me follow up here. I, I think there's something that needs to be noted, which is, uh, or repeated. After 9-11, not only was Congress demanding a lot, the impossible now, but the fact is uh, there was a, a terrible fear that there was a, another attack looming. There probably were, and they've probably been thwarted. Um, and I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about that, uh, of, about whether we've learned some lessons now going forward, because I think that uh, this is going to be a long, hard grind to um, address all these cargo containers and all these boats coming onto our shores <laughs> and trying to create a, a big impact, even if it's a small attack. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yes, there, there are lots of lessons learned, again, on the acquisition, on things we've done wrong in terms of cooperation among agencies. But, but for me, and this gets to the technology question you've asked, our fundamental strategy needs um, a relooking, and that's what we're doing. In terms of scanning everything everywhere, and of course, at the NDO and DHS, we're responsible not just for the ports, but in between ports of entry and within the United States, um, you have to ask whether a ubiquitous sensor system, technology alone, can really exist in any financially real sense. And I, I think the lessons that we've learned is we need to develop are in the process of developing an intelligence-informed response architecture so that when there is a heightened level of alert, we can respond with the detectors. And the previous speaker was um, from TSA, and of course, um, I'm not sure he was able to mention that, that we're working with TSA to ensure that the TSA Viper teams are, um, are capable of using detection equipment. CBP, of course, is the lar largest, but not the only DHS entity that can surge and respond when there's intelligence cues. So, and of course, state and locals are a key part of that. So the, what we've learned is we need to look at the architecture differently in exactly the way you described earlier, that is not looking at technology alone. Uh, well, I, do you mind if I ask him another question? Because it's a, you're a great resource here. Uh, in fact, there are a number of people who are expert in DNDO in the room, um, and they're welcome to comment as well. The global nuclear detection architecture uh, could you explain that briefly? Uh, it's a fascinating, I think, uh, profoundly important process that's been underway for a while. How important is that to maritime security? Could you explain what it is and then put it into context? Well, well the, the term global nuclear detection architecture was created in our founding legislation, and we've defined it over the years. Um, and most recently, at the end of last year, um, issued a government-wide strategic plan cleared at the deputy secretary, of secretary level that, that give a, a precise definition of it, where it begins, where it ends. But fundamentally, m my anticipation is that GNDA is the strategy, how we go about enhancing America's security and protecting against nuclear threats using people, sensors, um, communication systems, and intelligence. So um, That's around the world, though, not just in the U.S. Th that's around the world, but DNDO is most focused domestically. And I think once we at DNDO get our act together domestically um, and are effective domestically, things will spread. So, so we have a global responsibility, but um, within the limited resources that are available, our greatest focus is, is always going to be domestically recognized. We want to, of course, push this threat out as, as, as far as we get, can. So again, the GNDA, the architecture, is the way that we assign risks and assign resources. Do we just look at ports? Should we look, for example, as you know, the administration just 
um, support an extension of the Securing the Cities program? Should we look more in supporting state and locals? Um, do we need to focus more in between borders? That, that is um, together the architecture, which is made up of a number of documents, including the strategy, the, um, 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 the, the review of the, the architecture, and ultimately a detailed implementation plan. Yes. Uh, Greg Amidon from Seattle. Um, since most uh, college physics majors know that plutonium is only an alpha and beta emitter that can be effectively shielded if wrapped in aluminum, what's your strategy for detecting plutonium in cargo containers? Well, that goes back to the whole uh, uh, layered enforcement strategy where it, we don't rely just on the, art, on the radiation portal monitors themselves to, to, to detect the uh, uh, bomb in a box, if you will, but it's also through our, our targeting efforts so that we can identify that high-risk container, that high-risk shipment, that shipment that doesn't make sense to us, flag that for examination, and then using our large-scale X-ray technology, X-raying that container and seeing that uh, uh, bomb in a box, if you will, inside the container. Because the, the the X-ray technology we have now has come a long way compared to what we had just 10 years ago. Um, so we're the, basically the X-ray technology we were using 10 years ago prior to 9-11 was designed to find 2,000 pounds of you know, dope inside of a container. But now it's really designed to find that small device inside of a container, so that's what we, we uh, rely upon. I mean, I think I would say that the strategy was 100% scanning because that 100% scanning was to use both uh, RPMs as well as to use NII equipment. And the NII equipment will find highly dense anomalies which then could be used to do it. I think a, a fissionable uh, a critical mass of plutonium would be about a, as big as a grapefruit, maybe two grapefruits. So if you wrap that in two layers of aluminum foil, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't get any radiation out of it, correct? You couldn't scan for radiation. Someone in the audience maybe can address that. We can see so a grapefruit. So you have to be able to find two grapefruits in a container, basically. Yes, okay. we can. Hi, uh, Rick Ozzy Nelson from the Center for Strategic International Studies. I want to go back to, uh, to Steve, your second point on the, on the small boats. It seems like in the maritime environment, and this question right here indicates, we're spending a lot of our time and energy looking for the low probability, high impact event, yet probably the greatest threat that we're facing is the, low, is the higher probability, low impact, the small boats, not just the uh, terrorism, but the illegal smuggling, drugs, and whatnot. Um, and we still struggle to have the small boat strategy and an apparatus in place and compounding the problem is that we have a lot of interagency rivalries regarding resources, example, between CBP and the, and the Coast Guard. Um, can you uh, provide some insights into how we're going to to rectify that issue? Is the strategy going to come first? Is Congress going to be more involved in allocating roles and responsibilities for the executive branch? Thanks. Um, well, without revealing too much about the strategy, so the, the strategy is a public document, the, the uh, DHS small vessel security strategy and there has been a implementation plan and the implementation plan has a public version which talks about kind of the more detailed objections there is a uh, non-public version as well I'd say on the positive side what they've tried to do with that you know uh, sparing you the details which I obviously can't discuss is try to look at the, the different actions they could take to reach those objectives and figure it out is that a low cost, a medium cost, or a high cost option? And then looked at what the potential impact is of actually you know, closing some of the gap there. And, and is it likely to close that gap? Or is it uh, you know, maybe going to close the gap or not likely to close it? So it's at least uh, allowed the department, whether it's CBP or Coast Guard or even other uh, organizations uh, in DHS and beyond the federal government to try to say, well, what are these maybe can we actually afford to do that will make a a difference, but I do think you know we GA has been asked to look uh, across the federal government for areas of duplication, and we have some work ongoing looking at CBP and the Coast Guard, and, and you know they both operate in the same maritime environment sometimes, and they do some of the same things. And I think one of the things we found is it's it's not a question of them having overlaps; it's like trying to make 
both of their resources stretch to gaps that still exist there. So I, I, I'm not sure there's a, a lot of resource overlap as much as um, potential maybe for additional coordination and things like that. And the examples might be use of UAVs where uh, CBP has a, a growing um, fleet of UAVs that they can use in the maritime environment. Uh, Coast Guard is starting to get access to those to leverage those, but yet they still haven't really touched the whole Navy side. The Navy has some even uh, more um, impressive UAVs with, with very important capabilities. So if I'm looking for areas where we need to do uh, improvement as we move forward, it's trying to leverage the assets that we have or how can you kind of make some minimum investments to, to do that? I'd, I'd like to have one more question before we sign off here. Anybody have any other thoughts or? Yes. Uh, Ken Rapuana, the MITRE Corporation. Uh, I just made the observation, and it's been made by others, that this, this whole challenge set associated with improvised nuclear devices introduction in the U.S. is, uh, is a multi-layered challenge. A lot of the focus of the discussion here is on the detection piece, but uh, there are so many other pieces to it in the sense of, for example, the global nuclear detection architecture and how should it inform our domestic detection architecture. That, frankly, has been a gap in terms of we spent a lot of time and effort and resources on the domestic piece of it, and the global component has been a rather high level, let's just say. So when you look at detection, very similar to aviation security. Detection is just one small component. And in fact, it's at the, you know, it's close to that final line of defense. When you look at uh, nuclear threats, just as aviation threats, it's a dynamic adversary problem. So the adversary will be reacting to the measures that we take. And if we don't take a more unified, integrated approach, uh, we, we really risk these gaps continuing into the future. And, and that, I think, is, the, is really where the, the problem gets larger, because just like body cavity now is the avenue of choice for the advanced adversary, they will look at other than shipping containers, because of uh, it may be the largest vulnerability from a number of containers, but there are many other avenues that could be utilized. And that uh, small maritime threats are one of those that we still are quite challenged with regard to. Uh, I think that's an excellent way to close out the panel. It, uh, it captures some really uh, uh, very vexing, difficult human intelligence uh, and analysis problems that technology simply can't solve. Uh, I think you'll agree that our panelists uh, gave us some really interesting thoughts about this difficult problem, and uh, thank you for joining us. Just a couple of updates now. I said that there would be several during the course of the day, so let me give you just a few now, and I'll start with the later ones first. There will be a break after the session with Admiral Blair, and that break, uh, slight change, will be from...